Ottawa Centre and uh, welcome to all those uh, tuning in uh, online. Uh, we have a uh, we have a uh, very good show for you today. We've got uh, quite, a, quite a number of interesting speakers. Uh, there's some interesting stuff happening uh, astronomy-wise that's coming up, uh, some of it very soon. And uh, it'll be good to, uh, be, a, uh, to be a part of uh, the, uh, the upcoming ast astronomy day that we're having on Parliament Hill. Well, you'll get more about it. It's not actually astronomy day, but uh, Mike Mogadan and uh, Mark Garvey will talk more about that. So uh, without further ado, let's just uh, get straight into it. Oh, and once again, uh, for those who are presenting, um, two things. Uh, the dais is, the screen is once again not working, so you are going to have to turn around to, uh, to see your slides. But also, please, again, try to make sure that you are focusing your voice into the microphone. And there is only one camera this, uh, this meeting, so if you need to look into camera, it's uh, kind of on your right. I suppose the first thing you'll notice is that the screen appears to be less fuzzy. Uh, we seem to have made a breakthrough uh, with the projector. The, uh, the cause is uh, up for debate. It may have been simple, it may have been more complicated, but hopefully from, from here on in, we'll have uh, much sharper images and the images will do justice to those who take the time to, uh, to process the images and uh, the, the hours that they put in will be adequately reflected in the quality of the image and projection. All right, so these are the, uh, this is the uh, order of speakers for today. We have myself with a few introductions. Unfortunately, Al Scott can't be here, so we won't have his regular segment. Okay, if I do, May. So, uh, okay, yeah. if I do, May. April. Chris, Chris, you did it again. <laughs> Chris, can you do a, can you do a quick, uh, quick edit? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, don't worry about it. No. Oh. There we go. Okay, we'll, we'll do a quick edit. Who would rather be there? I don't know. It's pretty rough. Well, it's daytime. How can they be doing that? If they're navigating by the stars, it's not a good idea. There we go. Dave, you, okay, so we've got you for May. Uh, Tim Cole will be talking about the trends of Mercury. As I said, uh, Mike Mogadam and uh, Mike Garvey will be uh, speaking about the Parliament Hill transit event, as I called it the Parliament Hill mass transit event, simply because there will be a lot of people there. Uh, Brian McCullough will be giving an update uh, on the GA, including a sneak peek for the, those select few who are here. Uh, and after the break, we've got a very interesting talk from Carmen Rush uh, about uh, this gentleman, Isinga. Then we have the usual observations, announcements, and prizes. Uh, so first of all, uh, welcome to our new members. We have uh, four new members uh, in the last month. Uh, let's all make them feel welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join this wonderful organization. As I say every month, I hope you find it as rewarding as I have over the last uh, 17 years, nearly, that I've been a member. Uh, members of the news, we've had quite a few. First of all, we've had Is Red Light Best? An article uh, in Sky and Telescope uh, authored by none other than, none other than our Rob Dick. Uh, well done, Rob. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a long time since we've had a, a, a full article by an Ottawa member published in Sky and Telescope. And uh, that's the full article. It seems a bit blurry on the left side. Well, anyway, I'm sure if you get Sky and Telescope, be sure to read, uh, be sure to read uh, Rob's article. Again, it's about whether or not red light is actually best, and I believe makes the argument that uh, amber light is, uh, is best. Is that right, Rob? Is that the gist? That's correct. Thank you. Spoiler. Okay, yes, you're right. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Believe, I, I'm sure Rob, you know, actually does the argument justice rather than just blurts it out. I'm a lawyer. I don't have to prove it. All right. Uh, rather, sadly, we have uh, the passing of a, of a member, uh, Miss Margaret Jane Wrigley. Um, 
for those of you, I, I don't know how many of you knew her, uh, but uh, again, tragically, uh, we've, we've lost another member. Uh, just a few moments of silence, I think. This is, uh, this was a congratulations issued by the National Center to uh, one of our members who has been a national director and who has been editing, uh, editing astronauts for a long time. Uh, Karen, uh, has, Karen Finstad has been, uh, has worked tirelessly uh, with the center and uh, was working as a director and the national, uh, at national office and uh, has had to resign there, but uh, they, uh, they, read, they gave her some very kind words, and I'll just, I'll just read it out. Uh, Karen has contributed immensely, contributed immensely to the board, to the National Council, and to the society in general. She has created a sustainable model that her successor can step into with relative ease, has delineated the board secretary's role from that of the National Council, and has offered thoughtful and critical analysis and insight into every board decision over the past two years. We on the board will miss her presence and we and wish her and her family nothing but the best. If you have the opportunity to do so, please be sure to thank Karen for her hard work on your behalf. And Karen is here tonight. She's in the top right corner of the stands. So I think a round of applause in order. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, well. Uh, Karen, you would have been alright to put an astronaut. You can put it whatever you want in there. But thank you nonetheless. Alright, so with that, we'll just go right into uh, the first announcement. Dave, if you want to give us your talk, uh, your uh, presentation for me, the sky's for you. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at what's happening in, uh, in May. First of all, this is the, uh, these are the moon phases. Tonight is the best night. It's one of the cloudier nights. Welcome to Ottawa. <laughs> so we have a uh, full moon on May the uh, 21st. We do have uh, the uh, Ava Aquarius a meteor shower uh, tonight and tomorrow. Maybe if clouds clear up, you might be able to see it coming out of the constellation Aquarius. Uh, excellent viewing conditions if it is clear. With, uh, with the uh, new moon. Mm -hmm. You'll hear much, much more detail about this, but I had to include it, as it is one of the events. Uh, on Monday, the transit of Mercury, and that's the approximate path of Mercury across the Sun. So uh, it's from 712 to uh, 242. It is, uh, for those of you who are not, or are new to astronomy, um, Mercury is very, very small. Uh, you cannot see it even with a protected eye. You need to look at it through a, uh, through a telescope. Venus is uh, not visible at all uh, this month. And uh, Mars is visible at opposition on May the 22nd. Jupiter is visible all month. Saturn is also visible all month, and it will be at a reasonable time, about halfway through the month. You don't have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to look at it. Uh, Uranus is visible early morning later on in the month, and Neptune is visible also in the early morning all month. The International Space Station, the best viewing date and viewing time is May the 28th, and it will be rising to uh, 79 degrees, it'll almost be directly overhead. There's a picture of the, uh, of the path of the International Space Station. And one last little thought for the day. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, although we'll get to it in the uh, observations later, uh, Last couple of, uh, we've actually been a bit lucky the last little while uh, as we've had um, some clear, uh, I think it was a, a two weeks ago we had a solid week of basically clear uh, clear sky, so hopefully that streak will continue. But uh, knowing Ottawa, 
<laughs> it won't, but we'll, well, we'll hope for the best. Sometimes we do get lucky. Oh. Chris? We discussed this. Chris, are you able to change, uh, change the order? Hold on. Well, where's Carmen? Well, come on down. No, Carmen, stay Don't listen to time. And I don't mean just now. Just never mind. Don't listen to me. All right. There we go. So now, Tim Cole, transit retreat. Take one. So are they allowed to listen to me now? If they want. Oh, okay. So they are allowed. OK, folks. Um, yes, uh, Dave already ruined my intro. Sorry. Yeah. So you already know there's a transit of Mercury. We can't hear you, Tim. Oh, right, of course. <laughs> pick, pick, pick. Right. Yeah, you already know there's a transit of Mercury. This is actually an image from the last one in 2006. Um, what more can I say? Now, uh, just wanted to give you a quick rundown on what happens with the transit. Uh, basically, we have a small object passing in front of a bigger object. That's the definition of the transit. <coughs> Excuse me. And in this case, we've got Mercury passing in front of the Sun. A couple of things have to happen to make this, uh, to make a transit possible. The first thing we've got to do is, if you take a look up there, you will notice that we have Mercury at a fairly steep angle, which actually has less to do with it than you might imagine. And um, Earth, I've oriented here as the ecliptic, passing in front of the Sun. So we have to have that, that moment when Mercury is passing through the uh, line of the ecliptic. This is the view from ecliptic north, looking down from a couple of uh, astronomical units. And this is the standard thing that we have for any conjunction where we have Earth and Mercury lined up. But the, the thing is, is we've got to have the, um, the latitudes, the ecliptic latitudes match as well. This configuration will happen every 116 days. It's not a big deal. Uh, the, the big deal is getting the ecliptic, line, the ecliptic latitude to match as well. Um, in case you're curious, we have another transit coming up in three years, uh, and that will be a November transit. And uh, we'll see a little bit of, of, of how that one will work out as well. <clears throat> this is the transit geometry that we have to have, I know that comes in a clunky way, to have a, a transit happening. And this goes for any transit, Mercury or Venus. In, in this case, uh, we happen to have um, the main transit, so we have Mercury here in a descending node, not that, that matters terribly much. Uh, the nodes are the point where the plane of the orbit intersects the ecliptic, intersects the Earth's orbit. And here we have a line of nodes, so you will see here that the transits have to occur when the transiting object hits exactly the, uh, the orbit of Earth. So it's tied entirely to the location of the nodes. And uh, for Mercury and Venus, those nodes don't shift a lot. They do precess, but not to any great degree. So you'll notice that the opportunities are always six months apart. Um, Mercury transits are kind of irregular. Um, in the case of Venus transits, they're quite rare, but they have a very nice discernible pattern to them. Not so with Mercury transits. Um, on average, it's every 7.6 years, but you know, they um, stop. Um, as they say, you know, if you stick a, a foot in a bucket of ice water and a foot in, a foot in a bucket of steam, on average, you're comfortable. Um, so the average doesn't mean very much. One thing you will notice, though, is that there are a lot more November transits than there are May transits. Uh, in the 100-year interval that's roughly centered on now, we've got five May transits, 10 November transits. Uh, the May transits are prized because Mercury is so much larger. Um, 12 arc seconds instead of 10. Um, <laughs> celebrate now. Um, <laughs> yeah. So as you can also see, the transits aren't terribly rare. They're not super common, but I mean, we've got 15 of them in this 100-year interval centered on 2006. We had 13 of them in the last century. But they're rare enough that uh, you know it's a cool thing when they do happen, and uh, you'll definitely rue the cloud that will roll in uh, at approximately 7-11 Monday morning and roll out somewhere around 3. 
uh, with a couple little sucker holes just to make <laughs> you think it just might work. Um, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Be quiet, Deb. So why do we have such a weird, weird pattern? And the answer is not so much the inclination of Mercury's orbit, but that it's an eccentric little sucker. And you can really see this here. And you'll really notice the eccentricity makes quite a difference. I'm going to try to run this myself. Uh, come on. There we go. You can really see how Mercury is speeding up quite drastically as it approaches perihelion. It's, it's very, very noticeable in the animation. Earth, not so much a big difference. Uh, my first thought was, well, uh, the maze must be more common because, you know, it's faster. Well, sorry, it didn't work out that way. It was quite, uh, quite opposed to my general thought. Um, but when you take a look at it, you, you have a greater opportunity for opportunities. Greater opportunity for opportunities. Yeah, that'll work. Um, you have a greater chance of, of having the opportunity when you've got, the, um, you've got Mercury near, a, near its perihelion. Here's the chart for the worldwide transit. As you can see, uh, Oceania is out of luck for this one. Um, here in the eastern part of North America, we've basically got the whole thing. Same thing for most of South America. Um, the rest of North America, you'll at least get some of it. In fact, we're only likely to get some of it when you come down to it because you know, the sun is not going to be super high when the transit starts. So you know, more likely, we're going to see it in progress. So we have a very good opportunity. What this does tell us is that if we are clouded out, we have a very good opportunity, a very good chance of being able to stream the image from somewhere relatively nearby. So uh, we'll at least get something for the uh, transit event that, uh, that Mike will tell you about shortly. Speaking of which, here is the, excuse me, <coughs> here's the, uh, the chart of the hill centered on the eternal flame, I think. Um, <laughs> with sunrise, oh, excuse me, <coughs> yeah, I'm still hoarse for a cold I've beaten, I hope. Um, if not, somebody better not lick the microphone afterwards. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, okay, sunrise, uh, what this is telling you is sunrise we're not going to be able to see from the hill, which is fine because we won't be there. Um, and uh, for the ingress phase from the hill, um, it will be blocked by Mike Duffy. Um, <laughs> um, I know that was unkind, nasty, and unjust, particularly from somebody of my birth. But um, I don't care. Anyway, I'm a mean, nasty person, and you know that. Um, but you will be able to get a fair chunk of the transit from the hill. Up here we have the picture of the path of the transit, which is exactly unlike the one everybody shows you, and I'll show you why in just a sec. Here is the transit path as we would see it animated, though. I'll try to get this going. Come on, Whittle Animation. There we go. So basically, Mercury's coming up and then doing a massive swan dive into oblivion. Um, <clears throat> So here we have the two of them. The difference is in how it's plotted. The standard plot shows you from an equatorial orientation, and that gives you a nice clean line um, with the same times. This is topocentric, in other words, plotted from where we're viewing, and this gives you reality, which jumps up and whacks you over the head. Um, so if, if you're looking, stop that, behave. Thank you. Um, the point is, is that it's not going to be a neat, clean path across the sun, which you might suggest if it were a straight line. So if you've lost touch of where Mercury is, it might not be where you expect it to be, because if you're thinking of that straight line, it's going to be quite a bit different. You will probably have to do a bit of searching around. Excuse me. <coughs> so here's the thing. Sun, 32 arc minutes. Mercury, 12 arc seconds or about 1 160th of the sun's diameter. Yes, I know it's 1 158th, but I'm lazy when I type. Now, and honestly, I didn't think the difference was really worth mentioning, except that I, never mind. Anyway, so one thing that we've got going for us is that Mercury is going to show up as a very, very sharp disk on the sun. And that's the big advantage you've got, is that the contrast should be quite high. Now, I've taken a look at space weather, and it looks like we will have uh, a good chance for having some nice sunspots 
relatively near Mercury for some of its transit, uh, which should make it fun for displaying and just for, uh, just for enjoying. So that, that's always nice because, um, particularly if you're doing this as an outreach event, not necessarily for hours, but anywhere else, um, this has a great potential to be underwhelming for many people. I, yeah, I think it's cool, you think it's cool, but most other people will look and say, that's it. <laughs> I mean, I came out here and that's it. Hey, look, Edmund Halley sailed to St. Helena to see it. That only took him eight months and seven people dying from scurvy. I mean, you know. Um, and uh, I mean, heck, it was so popular, Napoleon went there later. Um, but seriously, I mean, it, it is kind of an acquired taste, truly. I mean, uh, just to see something like this. To my mind, what's fun about it is that you're getting a sneak preview of um, you're getting a sneak peek at the machinery of the solar system. Uh, we just see planets moving in the sky, and it's just a moving dot in the sky. Whereas here, you're getting the opportunity to really see, really get your face into it, that you've got stuff moving around the sun, that you really do have this big and cool orbital ballet happening. And uh, that may be something that's worth uh, playing up when you're uh, showing this to other people, that you're really getting a peek at the mechanics. And this is fairly rare, but you know, the bragging rights alone, I don't think, are enough. Uh, I think it's cool that we're seeing how things are fit together. Um, give you an idea of the size, I've uh, taken an image from the transit of Venus that you may recall. Venus was a good-sized disk that you could see with even a pair of eclipse glasses, but there is Mercury on the same disk, and it's, it's a lot tinier. As I mentioned, the only thing you've got going for you is that the sunspots are going to be fairly diffuse, and Mercury is going to be quite a hard, hard contrasty surface. Um, I was doing a little experimenting uh, a couple of days back, and it strikes me that if you can filter your image, something like a continuum filter or a green filter, you might have a better chance of finding Mercury because you're going to improve your contrast a bit, and you're going to cut down a bit of the seeing effects. Um, Naturally, that will probably not work, because I'm planning to try it, but um, it might be worth trying anyway. There's enlarged 200%. Uh, that is roughly what I was able to see with a 4-inch refractor and a 5-millimeter eyepiece. <clears throat> so even with, you're going to want all the magnification you can get, excuse me, <coughs> Sorry about this, folks. And you're going to want magnification because that's the only chance you've really got of seeing it. But uh, the good news is that it's accessible with even a modest, with a modest telescope. I don't think you'll have much luck with binoculars, but even a reasonable telescope that you wouldn't mind hauling out somewhere uh, will be fine. You're not going to need a monster scope with, with enormous magnification to see this. You are going to need a little uh, tenacity to, uh, to pull your way through it. So there you go, folks. Transit of Mercury coming up. Sacrifice chickens to the weather gods. And uh, let's hope it all works and we get something to see. If all else fails, we get another crack to be uh, disappointed in three years. <laughs>
When you are using a magnified piece of equipment without proper filtration, you might have as little of a, ten of a, of a tenth of a second before you experience permanent irreversible eye damage. Uh, the fact that you didn't see anything immediately is not comforting because it can take up to several hours before you will actually notice the damage in any permanent way. Please use this properly. If you do not know how to do it, find somebody who does and let them show you. I have to be uncharacteristically stern with this. Um, you will not be able to get solar filters between now and Monday. They're sold out just about everywhere. Uh, you may be able to find people who have them. Please do not improvise them. I've seen people make them out of things like potato chip bags and space rescue blankets and stuff like that. Uh, the worst part with that is it might sort of work. And then you discover hours later that you've got permanent damage. So please do not muck around. If you don't have the right filter, don't try it. If you don't know what to do, find somebody who does. Go to the opportunities. There'll be plenty of opportunities for people to help you out with this. Go find somebody. Don't muck your eyes up for this. It's just not worth it. Okay? Thanks. Um, Good point. On the, uh, oh, on, this, on the slide for Parliament Hill, yeah. you had the ingress angle and another angle, but then you had sort of yellowed in angles. Yeah, the, those are just sight lines for uh, significant parts of the eclipse. Sunrise, sunset, ingress, maximum, and I will let Mike speak to that. So what's the best time to come up to the uh, Parliament Hill to see everything? Well, it's 6 o'clock to get a good spot. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure when we're actually planning to convene. Uh, our maximum eclipse time would be at about uh, shortly after, uh, shortly before 11 o'clock. Anytime after 10 is probably a good chance of seeing something. Uh, but I will let Mike get into the details on that. I, I, left, I left something for him. Actually, I left a lot for him. Up, up the top, yes. Yeah, I just want to mention, Roman, that it's not just for the transit, but it's to learn about our closest star, the beauty about it, the danger about it, so it's an overall one-on-one about the sun. Okay, excellent point. Uh, just in case nobody caught that. Yeah, this isn't just the transit. This is a great opportunity to catch the sun, which is truly a wonderful thing to observe. And after this is over, you will have plenty of opportunities to buy filters. It's just that in any kind of a big sun event like this, there's a run on them. Normally, they're not hard to get. Okay. I think, I think we can. Question? One, one last question. Tim, with the transit of Venus, everyone's so anxious to try to see the black drop effect. Yeah. With Mercury being so much smaller, is there any chance of seeing the black drop? The black drop effect, uh, which actually was uh, um, apparently less significant for the last transit of Venus that we had, this is the effect of, if you take your fingers and hold them together and, and peer at a light, and just as you take them apart, you'll notice that they seem to stick together a little bit. That's the black drop effect, and it, it's a real effect. It actually is diffraction. Um, it turns out to be worse with bad optics. So if you've got good optics, which most people did for the transit of Venus, it wasn't a big problem. You could notice it, but it wasn't a big problem. Will you be able to see it with the transit of Mercury? It wasn't reported as being a big issue for the 06 transit, but you just might be able to see it. So uh, I think for us, the black drop effect will be fun. For the previous people who were trying to get accurate measurements with it, with old bad optics, it was a horrible thing. But for us, it could be fun. So keep your eyes peeled. You just might be able to see it. But yeah, the smaller disk of Mercury will certainly make it a lot tougher. Or maybe, we'll have to find out. That's the fun part of this. It's, it's all, every time is a bit new. I mean, things have changed a lot in 10 years. Anybody else? Hasta la vista, baby. Thank you, Tim. Um, and I have some at least temporary good news. The weather report for Monday in Ottawa is, and I'll read it out verbatim, sunny, high 16. So it's not even sunny with, um, with scattered clouds or anything. It's just any sunny. So hopefully I'll oh, it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Do I have to read out our policy on pseudoscience? <laughs> Just don't do it here. Okay. Go buy a chicken from Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Chickens, I sacrificed them all. I ate them, they were good. There is a story in, in Roman mythology about sacrificing about sacrificing Roman chicken. Mythology? Yes, Tim, thank you. Um, but you, don't, you really don't want to hear that story because it doesn't end well. 
Oh, for the chickens or for the people trying to sacrifice them. Um, there was uh, what uh, what you mentioned about uh, the about Edmund Halley traveling to St. Helena reminded me of a story from the transit of Venus uh, in the 18th century, where one gentleman French traveled from France to India. Le gentil. Yeah, arrived in 1761, too late for it, waited the eight years. When he finally set it up, a cloud was, it was clear skies except for one cloud which stuck in front of the sun for the entire transit event. I'm not making this up, this is 100% true. He went home and found that he'd been declared dead and his relatives had pilfered his estate. <laughs> I, I wish I was making this up. I am not. There's a play about it, Maureen. Oh, is there? Yeah, it's done by a Canadian playwright named Maureen Hunter, and it's called Transit of Venus. How it exciting. Is, it's about the world's unluckiest transit observer. There you go. Wow. It's uh, something for the entertainment column, anyway. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you very much, Tim. I think, we'll, I think the next is uh, uh, Mike and. Oh, sorry. There we go. Well, anyway, I'll let, I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Mike Magadan and uh, Mike Garvey keep, sp speak to this. So if you guys want to come, come on up and uh, tell us about the Parliament Hill Mass Transit event. Actually, Gordon, if you could join me as well. I mean, Gordon Webster and, and myself have um, been working uh, or organizing this event here. So let's go uh, get two slides for it. We'll come back to this one, Chris. So just a bit, just a bit of background in, um, on how this event came to be. But we, um, I'll start with that. But we, but, um, Tim, I want to challenge you on something. Uh, you know, what, I, uh, what I think is um, overwhelming about this is, is that a lot of people make comparisons between the transit of Mercury and the transit of Venus. Transit of Venus, as you said, big, huge dot, you know, um, uh, passing in front of the sun, quite, quite, quite easy to see. Transit of Mercury, you're right, it's a teeny tiny Mercury. But what the but? But it's surrounded by huge bureaucracies. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what's what's cool about this is that for people who are entering into, astro into astronomy, okay, Mercury is not easy to see. Mercury, you'll see, you know, because it hugs the sun and the orbit is pretty tightly around the sun. You only see it um, when it's uh, at greatest e at eastern elongation, greatest western elongation, meaning at certain times of the year when it's the when it's sunrise or sunset, it's furthest away from the. Um, um, from the sun, so you have to have the sun to set. In this case here, we're seeing Mercury smack in the middle of the daytime, teeny tiny Mercury. So um, that's kind of a luxury, I, th I think. And also something that you may have read today if you're looking at all the media stuff that I, I, I forwarded to you, is I think it was Paul Delaney said something really interesting here. He said, um, he said the same effect occurs with um, exoplanets, yes. where, you know, where you, um, uh, you know, seeing a transit, um, something passing in front of a distant star, is, you know, is, is, and seeing how the light curve uh, dips. It's, it's our way of seeing that uh, there are planets that are um, in other solar systems that are passing in front of a star from our perspective on Earth. So it has to make me wonder if maybe, um, what if, wouldn't that be something cool if uh, while we're viewing this, in another you know, many, many light years away, or somebody looking with their um, with their, uh, you know, their refractor, looking and saying, "See that? Uh, see that? Uh, I can see a little um, uh, exoplanet." Uh, uh, who knows? It's the Bogon constructor fleet. So, so, um, well, why don't you to refresh people on how this came to be, and I'll talk about the event or whatever. Uh, basically, what happened was in late March. Yeah, March. Uh, Randy Atwood, our executive director of National. Um, was at a, an award ceremony, I believe, for Chris Hatfield. And the science minister, uh, Christy Duncan, was there. And she approached him about doing an event, uh, an astronomy event, on Parliament Hill. So he figured the best of one would be sometime next summer. And we, he passed on the contact information to me. I contacted their office, and we spoke on appropriately enough, the 1st of April. And <laughs> we suggested that we wanted to do an event this year. Uh, the minister wanted to do something in conjunction with Science Week. And so we picked on the obvious, the transit of Mercury. And we've spent oh, five, so there's five, six conference calls trying to sort this all out. Uh, the RCMP has some interesting ideas about what you can and cannot bring on the hill all the time. Uh, anyway, that's where we are. We've got all the bugs we go, ironed out. Everything is set, and we're good to go for Monday. Mike will give you the details. 
Okay, so we've got 32 volunteers signed up bringing uh, 25 scopes. We're ca uh, that's it, we're, we're limited. Um, as, as Gordon says, the, uh, go ahead. No, I, I, I was just gonna say, if anybody else wants to volunteer, thank you, but we can't accept it because we had to give a list of all of the telescopes to the RCMP and they have a limit. Uh, they have us down as only having 18 scopes and we submitted a list of 25, so I don't know which one of us can't add, but. <laughs> yeah, so we've, um, there's a lot of restrictions, as, as, as Gordon says here. We, um, if you bring a telescope onto the hill and you haven't registered, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to send you away. That's, um, that's, how, that's how, how tough it is. Uh, of course, um, if you wanna show up on the hill without a telescope, you're welcome, you're welcome to join us. Um, uh, we've also, I think, I made mention to a group of you that uh, many of you that um, we have a bus that's bringing all the uh, volunteers uh, with telescopes and anyone who wants to join us on the bus. Um, um, at the same time, we want to arrive at the hill at the same time. Why? Because um, we are anticipating some difficulties with, again with the uh, the hill security, and we don't want to have the lone ranger setting up the scope, um, you know, uh, ahead of us or, or taking it down behind us. Um, Setting up the location, Janet, you asked. So it's, um, you, know, you know where the Centennial Flame is? We're gonna set up between the Centennial Flame and- um, We should be right around here. And, and- um, Centennial Flame's there. And the uh, front uh, stairs leading up to Central Block, okay? Actually on the west side of the pathway. Uh, you won't have any problem missing us, uh, or seeing us, I should say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Great party and slip, Mike. Um, if, if you're missing us, just bring out your scope. You should be able to find it. What's also interesting, I have to mention as well, is that there is a, I was looking on um, one of the uh, solar uh, websites, observing websites, uh, there's a big honking uh, sunspot just coming around uh, the sun right now. So that's gonna be very, very interesting. I'm sure in a, in a, in a couple of days, on May 9th, Monday, it should be, um, hopefully it won't be right on top of it. <laughs> it's gonna align with Mercury <laughs> following us. <laughs> um, we got, we got, um, uh, just about every kind of solar scope. So as, as, as Tim said, um, you really should, and it, don't do anything like looking at yourself. We, we, got, we got everything, all right? We got some, in, including some uh, nice video astronomy from Jim Thompson and, 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 and Tim. White light, H alpha projection, um, it, it's pretty impressive. Um, I wanted to say a couple things about that before I close about the uh, promotions. So you folks heard about um, Gary Boyle has been just doing a stellar job. Gary, I know you're here, thank you for this. Um, so he was on the radio, uh, you, you heard this morning at uh, f uh, five, um, 580 CFRA, actually this afternoon. He's gonna be on CFRA on, uh, again uh, with Mark, Matt Scooby at 9.19 uh, on Sunday morning. Hallie Cotton is gonna interview him on the Hill Live um, at 8.15 on Monday morning. Um, he's, we're close to um, having uh, John uh, Ruddle, Ruddle? Ruddle uh, of CTV News um, uh, interviewing him at 12 noon on the Hill. Uh, there was a article on, on in the uh, online on, on the Ottawa Citizen. Uh, Tom Spears wrote that. I'm hoping it actually appears in the paper tomorrow. We'll see. It's been tweeted by a number of you who, and, and put on Facebook by never you who sent me notes. Thank you for that. And we sent out a managed to send out. I think it's a little late, but we got it out anyhow. Um, uh, an email to all science teachers in the uh, Ottawa Carleton District School Board. So I'm hoping that pans out and does something. There's also been a lot of communications inside the um, um, inside the federal government as well. Yeah. So you're going to be on TV, so shirts and ties for everything. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the scenario, the, the actual scenario that we had to create for the minister uh, says that dress is business casual. Okay. Uh, <laughs> for, for those of you into this type of thing, uh, there was the minister herself who, who requested that this event take place, and she will be speaking at it. Um, I believe the time is at about 12:35. And Mark Garneau will be there with her as well. He will be part of the party. So, any questions on things we may have forgotten? Mike, just to mention, uh, Smart Scope's going to be active during the uh, transit, and Eric, our video guy, is going to be live streaming it. Okay, yeah. For those who didn't hear that, the uh, our our center is um, automated uh, telescope, um, remotely controlled telescope, is um, going to be uh, broadcasting uh, um, the transit of Mercury and. Uh, um, with Eric's help over the internet. Yeah, the we, URL's on our website. We, we have uh, plans afoot to have live streaming on the hill, but it depends on whether we can get a table, whether we're allowed by the RCP to have a table to set the monitor on. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs>
Okay. Any, uh, any last questions here? I'm really up time. No. Do you want to say why are we mount the buses and when? Um, I'd rather only uh, tell that to the uh, volunteers. Okay. If there are some people who want, to, we have probably about 10, 10 rides. Uh, 10. I would say 10 uh, spaces. I should say. Ten to fit. Well, we're going to have 32 volunteers. Yeah, but I would need a space for. Uh, yeah. So, so. If, if, if somebody needs a ride, okay, and you want to hitch on um, uh, ride on the bus, let me know. But I'd rather not broadcast it because I'm worried that we're going to, you know, go out of um, run out of space. So if you want to contact me, uh, actually right here in this meeting, and uh, we can we can slip you in, slip in some extra. Um, I'm sure we have about maybe 10, 15 extra spaces, so we could do that. I see a hand in the corner. Yeah, just are we telling chief do we expect us to dress up for this? I'll have my pants or t-shirt. I wouldn't worry about it um, because I'm supposed to be the one that's meeting the minister and, and basically brief them. I will be, but I, I live in my jeans the rest of the year anyway, so it doesn't matter. Is that it? Where is the bus leaving from? Well, again, I'd rather just tell it, and it's not like I want to be secretive, but I want to, don't want to have 200 people showing up for the bus. We only have 56 spots. So it, it's, I've already uh, said that to all the volunteers and all the people who bring their scope. However, we have about 10 to 15 spots. Um, so, okay, I'll tell you now, but I mean... Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you now, but, but I, I, I guess Chris did his arm back there in case you you, you got it. You, please, please, you got to tell me, because I don't want to have a case where, um, you know, we've got... We've got... Um, We've got uh, too many people and none in space, but uh, it's the uh, parking lot of the uh, Museum of Science and Technology. Next to the pit. Okay, so and that's at, um, at uh, the bus leaves at 8.15 sharp, all right, and um, so I'd encourage, well, anyway, if you want to come, hit me now. Sorry, I'll be uh, rough about that, but we, we do have only um, certain spaces. I'm going to mention a smart scope, so we're going to probably start around 7 o'clock. Actually, 6.30. We're going to be there at 5. 5 a.m. Okay. Yeah, and officially our event runs from 10 to 4. We're going to be there a little earlier. Um, we don't need ties and shirts as far as we go. We don't need shirts even. And we're going to talk to you about it for about an hour to start with. We're going to 10 minutes every hour after that until the very end. We want to get the very start and the very end. but. Because of limitations on our internet, we're going to have to break it down to running for about 10 minutes every hour after that. And we're going to, but we are going to record the whole seven hours. So those of you who have trouble sleeping you can always get a hold of the video and watch it. So anyway, that's that's part two. Okay. Yeah. The event, just the last thing, the event runs officially from 10 a.m. to, to uh, 2 p.m. Okay. That's when we. Uh, and we expect a whole um, a lot of um, parliamentarians and those kind of folks uh, at, at noon. Yeah, there's the people at lunch hour. Government's down camp. Exactly. Yeah, the minister has apparently had uh, a range for about somewhere fifty to sixty parliamentarians that are going to that have said they're going to take part. Okay, but if you haven't volunteered with the scope, uh, don't let that stop you. Come on down and join us, and you don't you can come in jeans. You don't have to dress up. Okay. Uh, one point, or just to make sure it's out, this is open to anybody in the public. Anybody. Yeah. Anybody in the public can come. And the more the merrier. Can bureaucrats come? <laughs> we will even tolerate bureaucrats. <laughs> Have any searches? <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, um, Mike and Gordon. Uh, certainly, and uh, an exciting time uh, on uh, uh, on the hill. A great chance for some exposure and to teach people who might not otherwise have uh, daily or regular uh, interactions with uh, science some some very interesting, you know, topical uh, science that uh, doesn't happen all that often. It takes couple, it's every couple of years. All right, so we'll move into the next speaker. And this is our resident historian, uh, Carmen Rush, with a wonderful talk, I'm sure, uh, about, uh, this, uh, about this gentleman and uh, his, his rather spectacular building project. Uh, I think I can safely call it that. So Carmen, over to you.
And, uh, yeah. and this is your next right. slide. Thank you. All right. Okay, well, uh, welcome this evening, and I'm here to give you another talk about a, a walk back in time, another interesting story that I've uh, found in my, this time in my travels, uh, because a year ago in April, um, I took a trip to the Netherlands to visit relatives, and while I was there, I went to a small town called Franeker to visit a planetarium uh, that was built in the late 1700s by a Wolkomer with uh, no formal education. Uh, his name was Asa Asinga. You're going to hear a lot of very strange names because uh, you know, the man was uh, from Friesland. Uh, it's a province in the north of Holland, and they speak uh, a very different language, Fries, up there. So uh, it's uh, quite interesting. Um, Asa Isinga was born on February 21st, 1744, in a small town called Dronrijk. So if you're not too um, up on your Dutch landscape, that this is the, um, the map of Holland then, and Friesland is the um, province up the north. And just to give you some perspective, actually, I should go back one. Um, it looks large, but um, the Netherlands from top to bottom is about the distance you would travel uh, going from Ottawa to Montreal. So, you know, you think, wow, that's a big province, but uh, not at all, because the um, area that I'm going to talk about, John Rape, where Asa Asinga was born, is right here, and Franeker is where he eventually moved and um, built his planetarium, and that's a distance of about 10 kilometers. <laughs> And this is where he's born. Uh, it's now, uh, it's, uh, it's, I think actually someone who lives in there, it looks like. You know, a bunch of stuff there. But anyway, it's still standing, still in good shape. Even from the 1700s, I must say that the Dutch public is very aware of its history. And um, anything that's an old building is immaculately kept. It's literally, when you walk into some of these villages, it's like you're walking back to the 1700s. Everything's just pristine. Uh, so Asa was the oldest son uh, with two younger sisters and a brother. Um, his father was a wool comber by trade, uh, someone who processed wool uh, from the sheep into thread so it could be woven into fabric. Uh, but his father, Yelta, had a hobby on the side. He was very good at mathematics, astronomy, and mechanics, and he was self-taught. Um, and he was very handy also. He built sundials and small machines. And Aza inherited this uh, talent from his father. Uh, when he was 12 years old, he had to leave elementary school to help his father with his business. Um, but um, Yelta then tutored him in math and astronomy on the side, and when Asa was 14, um, his father sent him to Franeker once a week to be tutored in Euclidean mathematics. So I showed you earlier, yeah, that's only uh, a distance of um, 10 kilometers, but the poor boy had to walk that distance there and back to be tutored by this uh, gentleman who was a friend of the family. Uh, his name was Willem uh, Weeks. By the age of 17, and I apologize for this picture. He's certainly not 17 here. I have to give you something to look at, so I'll get to that part of it later. Anyway, this is what a 17-year-old looks like when he's probably 16. <laughs> um, by the age of 17, Aza had already written a 665-page uh, book on mathematics based on what he had, had learned from his tutor. And even today, it's the marvel of the scientific community. And at 18, he wrote another two, uh, another two books, one on astronomy and the other on sundials. And uh, this sundial is one that he built himself. It's on Franeker time. And um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Then came a fourth book, this time on eclipses, in which he calculated all the future eclipses of the sun and the moon from the years 1762 to 1800. Remember, with no formal education, just that bit of tutoring. But he was lucky because he lived in a great era of scientific discovery. Uh, in the province of Friesland in particular, there were many what were called farmer uh, professors um, who were self-taught astronomers with telescopes uh, that they had built themselves. I went to one museum and there I got a whole lot of other names, so well, that's fuel for another talk. Uh, the general public in, uh, in, a, uh, in general was very aware of the starry skies because they were primarily farmers and relied on the changes in the night sky, and there was no light pollution then, so people were very aware of what was going on up in the heavens. Through his tutor in Franeker, Asa was introduced to many learned people, uh, because Franeker was a university town that had uh, municipal status dating to the year 1200, and a university that was founded in 1585, and it attracted students from all over Europe. On June 6th, 1761, the transit of Venus was to occur, and the farmer professors and the university were, were well aware of it. 
ASA was able to accompany a group that met with uh, wealthy citizens in a castle near, near a larger town called Leowana uh, to witness the transit. This is the typical equipment they would have used. With their telescopes, images were projected onto the screen. Uh, measurements were also then taken to determine the size of the sun and the sun to earth distance. And this event was a pivotal one for ASA. He was only 17 at the time, and from then on he threw himself into the study of stars, planets, uh, moons, meteorites, and many sun dials. When he was 24, he married a woman called Picha Jacobs, and the young couple moved to Franeker. And they moved to this house, but obviously the assigned planetarium was not on it at that point. Um, so, um, he, in the end, they had three children, uh, a girl that died in infancy, and then two boys, uh, Yelta and Jacobus, and both sons also were gifted in math and science. So Asa there began his own wool combing business, like his father, and he was very successful. This is typically what they would have, uh, the working conditions in, in that kind of uh, period of time. Um, wool combing was actually um, a big business, and Asa was very successful in it. In 1820, he won an international prize for his wool dyeing. And in Franeker in particular, there were 21 wool combers, and it was a wealthy business to be in because wool was the primary source of fabric, so it was in very much demand. But it was also hard and very smelly work because the wool had to be washed and combed and dyed and spun into thread so that it could be woven into fabric on a loom. Uh, and Asa himself had many wealthy clients in other towns and cities. Well, building a planetarium was not at all on his mind at that point, but a celestial event in 1774 was about to change all that. Astronomers determined that a conjunction or a lining up of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and the Moon would occur in the early morning of Sunday, May the 8th, 1774. So this is an artist's rendition of that conjunction. So there's a lining up of the planets and the Moon. Um, so um, they determined then that the exact date of the event. Uh, but in the meantime, a newspaper in the neighboring town published a letter by a, quote, seeker of the truth that said that it was a sign that the end of the world was coming, something like this. And because of the gravitational forces, the planets would collide, the Earth would be thrown out of its orbit and burn up in the sun, and it just went on and on. And the later writer uh, actually turned out to be a clergyman who obviously felt threatened by you know, other powers that, that God was not in control of, supposedly it looked like. Um, and um, the local government, um, believing the professors in Franeker, of course, uh, were rather reluctant to um, let this get out of hand, because it certainly was at that point. So they sent a, a professor of math from the university to write a rebuttal letter, but it didn't do any good. It was far too late at that point, because people were so terrified that businesses shut and people stayed in their beds on the fated day. But the event in the end was witnessed by many intellectuals and scientists, including Asa and the day passed quietly. So after this, Asa was so concerned about the lack of education of the townspeople that he decided to find a way to educate them in an understandable way. He decided to build a planetarium in the ceiling of the living room of his house. Not something you would maybe think of doing. Um, he calculated it would take him seven years to build it, while at the same time continuing to work as a wool comber. In fact, he promised his wife that that would be done, um, and she must have been a very patient and understanding person because he spent most of his time uh, planning and building it. So this is his house. Um, at the top, it was built in the 17th century, by the way. At the top uh, gable, which is very typical of Dutch houses, uh, you see a small little uh, um, sort of um, engraving there. It's, it's a stork. And that's the name of the house, De Uyufar. Uh, that's the store in Dutch. And between the two second-story windows, uh, there's the sundial I was talking about that he had built. And over to the right here, over the gate, uh, there's a saying that's uh, inscribed. It says, look before you leave. So this is the living room of his house. I'm just going to take a second for you just to have a look. There's a lot to see before I go on talking, so have a look. Sorry, it's a little bit grainy, but it's very hard to get pictures of this on the internet. <clears throat> so in every way, it certainly was a room where they lived, and basically, in those times, they, their living quarters was everything altogether. 
Uh, what you can't see behind here, behind the table, is the hearth where they would uh, cook their meals. They ate them at the table here, their dishes. They slept in this little cubby hole here. They, they slept sitting up because they were afraid that if they slept uh, lying down, uh, the blood would run to their heads and they would all go crazy. <laughs> Interestingly, that Aza was such a scientist, really, and then he still really didn't believe that. Uh, and then this little cupboard here, you could pull out the drawer, and then the kids slept in there. <laughs> Very different times. I don't think there are too many kids these days that would put up with that. So, um, and on the ceiling, you can see a part of the working model of this um, uh, solar system. Uh, it's a working model of the solar system, um, minus, of course, Uranus and, and Neptune that hadn't been discovered yet, and Jupiter has only four moons, and Saturn has one ring and only five moons, because, of course, nothing more is known about it at that time. And the scale of the model is one millimeter equals one million kilometers. So obviously, these planets and the sun are not drawn to scale, because otherwise, you were not created to scale, you wouldn't be able to see them. Um, he did use circular orbits up at the top here for the, the orbits of the planets, um, and he did know that they were ellipses, but the problem was that had he used elliptical tracks, it would have made the clockwork uh, very complicated and much more intricate than he was able to do. <clears throat> and all the original paint, everything is, is original. They did do some restoration, but basically these are the vibrant colors that it would have been in the time. So that's the ceiling. Um, there are grooves here through which um, um, all these trace out the orbits of the particular <coughs> planets, so that's you know, um, Mercury, of course. The other one is uh, Saturn. <coughs> and the grooves in the ceiling um, uh, connect to a metal rod, so all of these are supported, all the, all of the planets are supported by metal rods, and uh, they pass through the ceiling and they're connected to wheels behind, behind them that rotate with precisely the right revolution time uh, that would be the, the time taken for each planet to, com to complete an orbit. Uh, to compensate for the fact that he didn't use elliptical orbits, I'll focus on Saturn. You can see these little arcs here, these little white arcs on the track there, and they are used to show that, um, first of all, you see the letters NP here, and uh, VP for induction would be furthest point. So the elliptical path then, the nearest point that it would track would actually be there at that position, even though this is circular. And then at that position over here, the, the, the planet would be at its furthest point from the sun. So, and I mentioned about the, um, let's see where I am. Yes, and the inclination of the planet's orbit with respect to the plane of the ecliptic plane, because um, as was mentioned earlier, each planet is not actually um, orbiting the Earth in, the same, in precisely the same plane that we are. So to show that, these white circles here, if the white track here on, say, Saturn's orbit is on the outside of the orbit, it means that it would be uh, inclined more to the northern uh, ecliptic, uh, part of the ecliptic plane, you know, that was above our plane, and then over here it would be uh, below. And uh, there's one ring past Saturn. So that's uh, Saturn's track here. And then there's one ring past it that has all the days, all the months, and the days of the year on, on it. And you can't see it too well, but there's a little pointer there that travels around and in 365 days, it's come a long way around again. And uh, from this, as the pointer moves around, Wherever it is, there's also uh, parallel lines that are running here, and you can also uh, get more information about um, the sun's inclination in the sky at any time. It's, I'm going to stop for a minute just to let you have a look. It's really, it's really a work of art, and the, and the photographs do not do it justice. It is really just stunning when you're actually in that room and you think this, this man lived in the 1700s and yet was able to build this very intricate uh, clockwork me mechanism that made all this run. It's really, really amazing. And he got everything right too. Um, for example, about Mercury uh, being a little bit displaced, you know, about its orbit. So another view, and I'm going to talk about. Uh, these guys in the center here. Uh, did I ever uh, 
know about Sir Isaac Newton. Is Sir Isaac Newton uh, made an, uh, what do they call them, an orrery? Right. Very similar, only tabletop. Probably unlikely. And so he, he probably didn't I think unlikely because he didn't really have contact with scientists. He was just a Wolkhomer and Franeker that had some higher education, you know, likely just through a bit of tutoring and he just liked to tinker around and build things. So over here, you can see a dial that shows, as it turns around, that the arrow points to the day of the week, uh, what sign of the zodiac you're in, the date, and this date is, has a, is a, there's a wheel that rotates underneath here, and every 22 years it has to be rewritten, because the dates obviously change. So obviously they have meticulously kept this up. Hmm. Been a long following after him, uh, very proud citizens of Franeker, that have uh, maintained that, that building. And there are also moon dials. You can see, yeah, um, quite a few moon dials. One shows the position of the point of intersection of the moon's orbit with the signs of the zodiac. Another shows the distance between this point and the moon. Uh, another shows the phase of the moon. Uh, that one is uh, over here. These dials just keep rotating around it. Uh, another shows the part of the moon's orbit that's over the plane of the Earth's orbit and under. And another dial predicts uh, lunar and solar eclipse times. And this one here is one, uh, this particular disk here I'm going to talk about next. That is a planisphere for Franeker for all times of the year. Uh, it's basically a star map. And it shows the constellations that would be in view both in the, the daytime and the nighttime. So the, there's a disk behind here that just rotates out of view, and whatever you can see at a particular part of the day becomes in, into view there. And this, is, this vertical metal rod, metal rod is um, uh, the meridian, and the six, there are six curved lines that point to uh, the main compass points. So again, I remind you, this was uh, constructed in the late 1700s uh, by a man with little formal education. No telescopes, he didn't have a telescope of his own, actually. Um, no calculators, computers, and every single movement is perfectly accurate. So the question is, how do you build it all? Well, I'm not going to go into all the math and the gears and all the rest, but first of all, the main thing was, um, this ceiling actually is not the original ceiling of the uh, living room. He built a second ceiling under the main one. So this, this second ceiling uh, is what you see. And these um, grooves in here actually are cut completely through that new ceiling, and these discs can be actually removed. So what he had, he did was he replaced them back in there, but you could take them out if you wanted to. You could go behind uh, between the two uh, ceilings and then uh, take it all apart if you wanted to. Um, and most of the cogwheels behind, I'll show you some pictures of that in a second, actually, I have one now, yes. Um, most of the cogwheels are made of oak, and they were made by Asa's father on a self built a mechanical lathe. And the largest wheels aren't solid, actually, they're hoops. Uh, that was to cut down on the weight of the thing. And every single wrought iron metal pin in, the, in these gears that you see, and there are 10,000 of them, every single one was made by hand, by Asa. This one here, this picture, is uh, the gears that are behind that plant sphere that I showed you earlier. Some of the wheels in the primary uh, clock that drive the mechanism are metal, and those were made by a clockmaker, but everything else was made by Asa with the help of his father at some point. And the cogwheels that power the moon dials are especially intricate because they have to be elliptical uh, to make the motions vary in speed and feed into other circular wheels. And most of the wheels are in the attic, so when you go up there, um, you'll, you, basically, when you go up there to see these wheels, nothing seems to be moving. And it's because it takes so long for the orbits to, to travel. Um, it, it moves too slowly to, for you to uh, see them moving. You only basically see one tiny cogwheel uh, moving, and that's, the, uh, cent that's for the central clock that controls the whole mechanism. For example, the cogwheel for Saturn has 538 pins on it, and it moves one pin forward in 20 days. And some wheels, in order to compensate, especially the, the moon information, uh, some wheels have to be able to move forward and then, and then backward. Another view up there. 
and these would be in the attic there. And this guy down here is Mr. Nobody. I just couldn't find a better picture. It's not Asa. <laughs> and the power to, to um, um, get all this equipment running and, and to get the wheels in motion comes from eight weights, and they're attached to a main axis, and these ha uh, hang in these little closets on either side of the bed. And they require minor adjustments from time to time. And in fact, only one pendulum regulates the entire speed of the mechanism and it's above the bed cupboard. You can't see it, but it would be swinging above here, behind the wall. At first, Asa wanted that particular pendulum to be one meter long and swing 60 times a minute, all very logical. And the construction of the entire planetarium was almost finished, and at the last minute, Asa noticed that a pendulum that long would mean that he would in fact have to cut a hole in the roof above the bed where they slept and let the uh, pendulum swing freely right above their heads. So, obviously his wife was not impressed, and she vetoed it. Um, so he had to cut 25 centimeters off that pendulum, and that was a really big deal, because then all the gears were out of sync in terms of the timing. So he had to re-time and, and readjust every single gear in the entire uh, ceiling. So in the end, he did use the shorter pendulum, and it swung 80 times a minute, and um, everything was in working order. And wisely, he wrote two books so that anybody who would want to take on that planetarium after he passed on would know how to maintain it. Well, very few people, in fact, knew what he was up to because he was a wool comber by day and a construction expert by night. But eventually, word did get out to the university. And in 1782, just as he was finishing the planetarium, a professor, Van Swinden, from the University of Franeker, came for a visit to see things himself. And he returned later with some colleagues, and they were absolutely mesmerized because they didn't understand at all how it worked. Uh, it took them days, in fact, months, of careful scrutiny and asking all these questions uh, to actually figure out the math and the science behind it. And in the end, Van Swinden himself wrote a book about it. Well, the university itself was so impressed with Asa they decided to give him uh, guest lecture status on astronomy. And he was in fact very popular with his students because he wasn't a conventional teacher. He would take the students outside the town walls in the evening so that they could have a clear view of the starry skies. And he used to sit on a stool. And uh, the story goes that once when he was called away for a brief time, which was a setup by his students, um, the students cut the legs off the stool and just left the seat behind. So when he came back, he just stood there and said in a very good-natured way, well, either the sky has risen or the earth has fallen. And that was that. Just, here we go. They never tried it again. Um, well, he was getting bored again because he just finished his planetarium and you know, life was too conventional. So he decided to get involved in politics and social causes. And in 1776, he became a collector of the poor. Uh, that's someone who uh, organizes the administration of donations to the poor. And then later, officer of the civic guard. And in 1777, he was elected to the town council and became a tax collector. Um, but it wasn't a very good time to be involved in politics because political turmoil was beginning in the Netherlands at this time. Uh, the Dutch had just lost the fourth Anglo-Dutch War in, in 1780 to the British, and there was growing resistance to William V's rule, and a band of revolutionaries called the Patriots. They almost look American, and there's good reason for that. So there was this band of revolutionaries then that was starting to take hold, and they called themselves the Patriots, and they modeled their principles on the American independence of 1776 and the French Revolution. And Franeker actually was a, a big hotspot for, for them. Uh, they were getting considerable uh, support. So poor William V was forced to flee with his wife, Princess Wilhelmina of Prussia. And in retaliation for this, her brother, Frederick William II uh, of Prussia, sent 20,000 troops to the Netherlands to help squash this rebellion. Um, now, unfortunately, at the time, Asa was on the town council, and the patriots, most of, them, most of the town council members were also patriots. He wasn't really, he was kind of trying to take a back seat on that. But he was implicated because he was you know, sitting with them. So he and other members were forced to flee and leave their families behind. And many of them went to northern France because at that point, uh, with the French Revolution, they were more sympathetic to that sort of patriotic, uh, patriotic uh, slant. 
but Asa decided to go to Gronau in Germany. And in 1790, he did dare to move back to Fisflut, which was very close to the Frisian border. Uh, but, uh, and, and there he had heard that in the meantime, his wife had died, and his two sons were living with his brother. Unfortunately, someone ratted on him, and the hiding place was discovered. He was arrested, and he stood trial for the involvement with resistance, and was imprisoned. And in 1792, he was exiled for five years from Friesland. Uh, later after that, he did return to Fisfleet, Fris and married for the second time and had two daughters. And unfortunately, uh, this never did come to pass, but he was already planning to build another uh, planetarium, this one, a dome one, uh, but he was never able to, to, um, to, to do that. You might, remember, you might recognize the person on the horse. Well, political turmoil continued, uh, supported by the French army and uh, Napoleon. The Patriots returned from exile in 1795 but then the French, instead of being allies to the French, to the Dutch, had certainly uh, another idea in mind. They turned around and conquered the Netherlands. And uh, actually, this, this benefited Asa because after that, his exile was ended and he was allowed to return to Franeker. So he did return, finally, with his new wife and two daughters and was reunited with his two sons. But in the meantime, all his possessions had been sold and his house was rented out to strangers. The planetarium, everything in, in, the, in the ceiling was still intact, but it was not operational anymore. Well, after a year, the rent was up, and then he was able to get to, uh, back into his house. Uh, so thankfully, he was able to get the um, planetarium started. He started his Wollacombe business again, and uh, he was uh, appointed curator of academics at a high school in Franeker. Um, it was at this time that his oldest son uh, passed away at the age of 34. However, unfortunately then, by the order of Napoleon, the university in Franeker was closed in 1811 and never reopened again. And the Netherlands remained under French control under the defeat, uh, until the defeat of Napoleon in 1813. And um, I remember my Dutch grandmother saying that there are actually in, in, in Dutch, there are a number of French words and she always was telling the story that, yeah, it's from Napoleon and I never really understood. Uh. So actually I learned a lot about Dutch history you know, at this point during this talk. So um, after the, the defeat of Napoleon, uh, the Netherlands, um, the Dutch monarchy returned, this time under King William I, uh, who was the son of William V. William V actually was not called a monarch. He was called a stat holder. Uh, I don't know enough about history to know why that was. But actually, this was a very fortunate uh, turn of events because King William ended up uh, being his most valuable ally. Uh, the king awarded uh, Asa the Order of the Lion in the Netherlands in 1816. And in 1818 and 1820, he paid him a personal visit uh, with uh, his crown prince, uh, Frederick, to see the famous planetarium. And in 1826, he bought the planetarium from Asa Asinga for 10,000 guilders, which in that day was an astronomical sum of money. And uh, he was actually Isaac himself was shocked that why would a monarch want to buy it, but uh, it's just because he was just so impressed with it. Um, so he and his son were allowed to live in the house rent-free. They received an annual salary to maintain and show the planetarium. And in 1827, a formal portrait was painted of him, and there's an inscription above uh, here that in Latin it means he reaches fiery castles of lights. On August 27th, 1828, uh, Asa Asinga died at the age of 84, and at his re request, he was buried beside his father in Geronre. His son, Jacobus, continued to run the planetarium for 30 years, and in 1859, the planetarium was given to the city of Franeker. Then, after Jacobus' death, his daughter, Sukia, managed the building, and then her sister, Yeltia, and then her daughter, Hitia, I'm not exaggerating these are the names. It's a very different language. Um, ran it until April 1922. And this was the last of the direct descendants of the Asinga family. Since then, the planetarium has been run by many different people. At one point, it was with a clockmaker. I did manage to find a picture of one of them, the gentleman, because he, in fact, was quite famous. He ran the planet planetarium for 42 years. He looks a little bit shell-shocked, I thought, maybe after running a planetarium for 42 years, that would do it to you. His name was uh, Parker Terpstra, and he ran it from 1941 to 1983. The interesting thing is, 
Um, I was only eight years old when I saw this planetarium for the first time uh, because um, my mother uh, is Dutch and all of our relatives are in Holland. So uh, we, every three years, would go over to visit mainly our grandparents. And my grandparents lived in Friesland. So my grandfather, when I was eight, I remember saying, oh, I have to take you to the planetarium. I didn't understand what that was at all. And when I, I still have, oh, I don't know what I did. Oh, maybe I did. Um, I still have these uh, vivid memories of uh, my grandparents didn't have a car. No problem in Holland because they have such great transit. The train, if the train comes at 201, it's there, 201. If you're there at 202, forget it. It's gone. <laughs> So very, um, you know, appropriately we went to the station, we took the train up to Friesland, uh, and up to Leeuwarden, and then uh, another little train uh, went to Franeker, and then we had to get off and walk, you know, into this ancient looking little town, you know, walled town with lots of canals. And then we walked into this room, and you know, there are all the plants hanging from the ceiling, so I've never forgotten it. And uh, interestingly enough, that would have been in the 1960s, so he would have been the curator there. I've seen him now for the first time. In 1983, then it was taken over by another gentleman called uh, Hank Newenhouse, and he expanded the museum to, to um, show the wool combing business also. And there's a little museum beside the house uh, where that, that is all shown. And after that, the planetarium underwent a major restoration in 1997 and was made a foundation in 2002. So other than the planetarium, there are other ways to remember him. Uh, a stone with his name is on the church in John Ray, where he's born and the house that I showed you earlier that's still standing. And in that little village, there is a statue of him opposite his house. And it says here, Yelsha's um, Isega, um, Woolcomber, um, I don't know what that would be, save something, anyway. Uh, maybe that's having to do with this religious slant. Uh, so born um, February 1744, at drone rape, um, 27th of August, 1828. Um, that's in Freeze, so I'm not sure what that means. Yeah. And um, this is the grave. He's buried with his father. And I found this on a bridge in Franeker, very close to where the planetarium is. And you can see a close up of this image there. And all the books still exist, as well as this portrait. So I hope you'll have a chance yourself to see it one day. Really, as I said, the pictures don't even do it justice, even, even though they're really just amazing to see. But just actually see it in the flesh and to think that uh, something that was built in the 1700s is still standing today and is still completely down to the second accurate on all the orbits is really mesmerizing. Any questions? Chuck, do you have questions? Yeah, just a quick one. I'm surprised that all that survived two world wars. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think what helped was um, Friesland is like way up north. You know, not too many people. Basically, for most of the Netherlands history, it was basically farmland. farmland. Nothing really of value. The um, University of Franeker closed, you know, in, in Napoleon's time. So I think it was just kind of overlooked, and nobody even bothered to bomb it. Surprising though, because if you look at the geography, um, just going to go back. Just going to go back to the map. Um, the Netherlands is not that far away from Britain, and Britain had its bombing. You know, it's more up here. So it, you know, it's not really that far away. If you're wondering what these lines are, they are the big dikes that were built. Uh, because these two um, pieces of land were not land um, until uh, the, the latest one, I think, was even in the 1970s. They drained what they call a polder. They drained the seabed and built these huge, massive dikes here. Uh, and they used it as a farmland. It's um, amazing, actually, when you actually get a chance. I drove across this dike. And it's downright scary because it's a two-lane, if you could call it a highway, and there's basically no shoulder. Like you're driving on the road, and you look there, and there's this tiny little railing, and you think, okay, if I just go a little off to the right, I'm in the North Sea. <laughs> and I got stuck. Um, this was not in this trip. I 
every year, uh, I've been to the Holland myself, just uh, by myself, uh, two times now, um, uh, without any relatives or family. And uh, I rented the car, I was driving all around, I thought, oh, no brainer, the Dutch roads are so immaculate. They don't have frost, really, so there are no potholes. You just drive, you don't even feel like the tires are on the road, you're just kind of floating. Uh, except when I got on this and I hit some massive rainstorm, and there was literally nowhere to pull off. It's about 20 kilometers, so as long as 20 kilometers in my life. But I made it. <laughs> any other questions? Uh, all right, yeah. go ahead. Is there any record of how many people visit that per year? There is a guest book, and apparently there's there's still even the guest book. Um, I'm not sure how many people do. You probably see it on the internet, but uh, apparently they still have the original guest book when the king came, you know, for his visits. But important, unfortunately, since then someone ripped the page out at, at some point. So uh, I guess they wanted the souvenir, so that no longer exists. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. When I when I went there the latest time uh, a year ago, there were a lot of school children running around. So it seemed to be the focal point for field trips. They all had their assignments to do too, but uh, it was quite amazing how many, how many people you can pack into a room. When I went there when I was eight, um, we, were, we went in July and it was stinking hot, terrible humidity. Of course, the, the, everybody closes the doors and windows and we're all baking in there. And uh, there was a seniors group that was also having a tour and they were very, you know, no windows open, it was, you know, it's too cold. <laughs> we're all sitting there and I was standing there beside my sister my younger sister, and all of a sudden, I could see out of the corner of my eye, she's going down and down. Yeah. And she fainted dead out, and my mother at least had the presence of mind to pull her glasses off, because in those days, he didn't have uh, you know, shadow-proof lenses, so she didn't have a spare uh, pair of glasses for her, so she grabbed the, the, the glasses and poured these going on the floor. <laughs> then the windows went open, though. So I have very, uh, very different memories about that planetary. So rather than grab your sister. That's right, she grabbed the glasses. <laughs> We're all still talking about that in the family. Oh, you remember? And my sister just goes, "Gosh." Oh, it's good to have priorities. Yeah. Any, any other uh, any other questions? Oh, Jen? One, one quick one. What was the approximate size of that room? Um, well, you might get a better relief. I don't know the actual dimensions, but it's not big because. Uh, oh. Mm -hmm. oh. I don't know what I pressed. <laughs> just to find room, yeah, where, where the guy was standing there, at least for nobody. It seems pretty there. small. It's very small. Yeah. Because if you get the relief and the bed, you know, if you think how long is it, how tall is this guy? He's not very tall because those door frames are very low. And the house was built in the 1700s and very, very low doors. So it was not wide. When you think that a family of five at one point lived in there, in one room, because he had his wool combing business too, and there was another room I think behind there, uh, but uh, they used that for the wool combing. Basically, they had a business right in the house, and there was nothing upstairs, just a, just an attic, and certainly there was nothing there. there was, you know, no space available after those cog wheels went in there. I can tell you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carmen. That was, uh, it was very interesting. Actually, a quick internet search uh, seems to indicate that the uh, that the construction of uh, Mr. Isinger, the orrery, if you want to call it that, is the oldest still functioning orrery in the world. So, you know, good for him. He knew how to build uh, build something that last. Last. All right. So now on to the observations. We have two observers, Dave and Bob. If you want to come down. Uh, and we'll just go in order. Dave, you're up first. Okay. Okay, um, I took the, uh, the uh, astrophotography course with Paul Kleininger, and I've been trying to uh, get uh, some pictures. This was taken last Tuesday. Their mics are ringing a little bit here. Uh, last Tuesday at 9.35, I lived with my next star, Celestial Next Star 5, the T-adapter, Canon 60D at ISO 800, an exposure of 1 50th of a second. Uh, this is a, co a composite of the same image processed two different ways so that I could uh, bring out the uh, moons uh, without having Jupiter washed out. And from left to right, you can see Ganymede, then Jupiter, Europa, and Callisto. And out of the frame and uh, to the left, would be uh, Ganymede, and this was taken last Tuesday. And um, 
just to the right of where my scope was pointing was the street light. It wasn't ideal conditions, but it came out okay. Thank you. Some, not all of them were what you'd call good, good observing uh, imaging nights. Uh, this uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy, kind of an interesting galaxy. It was the first galaxy uh, that they noticed uh, spiral um, uh, arms. Uh, they didn't know what they were, but they noticed them. And it was done by a guy called Lord Rossi. And uh, he used a 72 inch. Uh, refractor to do that, and in the 1800s, uh, if I had the lights on, I could tell you when exactly, but I can't, so. 1840, maybe, something like that, he noticed this. Um, now, the, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice that it's actually two galaxies, and uh, the little galaxy uh, is, uh, looks like it's getting sucked into the big galaxy. Uh, but in actual fact, it's behind the big galaxy, and they're making a wild guess here, but they think that about 500 million years ago, it came from the back to the front, out uh, towards us, and then it turned around from gravitational pull, and about 50 or 100 million years ago, it was screaming back the other way. And uh, that's sort of what's given it the whirlpool effect. Uh, it's about, uh, I think, 23 million light years away. And uh, these, uh, I'm going to show you three galaxies that I imaged this month, and they, they're all up near the Big Dipper, so they're high in the sky. They're all visible with, with telescopes, so if you have a telescope, get out and take a look at it. Okay, sunflower galaxy. Uh, you'll notice that it's not, uh, uh, also uh, made up of a whole bunch of little short arms. Uh, A bunch of little short arms, and uh, Lord Rossi also noticed the spiral galaxy, the spiral arms of this one, uh, after after he noticed it in the in the, in the uh, uh, M51. This one is a little further away. Uh, I think about 30 million light years away. Okay, next one. Uh, this is the black eye galaxy, or the, I prefer another name for it is the evil eye <laughs> galaxy. I've actually never heard you call that. I just saw that on Wikipedia. Uh, it's about the same distance as is the uh, galaxy uh, M51, 23 million light years away about. And uh, what's interesting about this is, is that you'll notice that there's an inner ring, a couple of inner rings. They are rotating around in opposite directions, which uh, is very difficult to explain. Uh, the most likely cause is maybe a, a combination of two galaxies spinning other directions collided, I mean, they're, they're making a lot of guesses. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to our observers. Uh, as always, we love to have uh, observations come in. So I guess we'll just uh, move on with the uh, rest of the, with the kind of closing phases of the, uh, of the night. All right, uh, Mike? Uh, do you want to tell us about uh, the dates for these uh, star parties coming up? Is he here? Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Garvey. Uh, I'm taking over the star party coordinator for Mike Mulgan. Uh, you'll see up there that just shows the location. Um, we just sent out the dates and got the paperwork started from the library and the insurance. Here you can see the, the, the primary dates for the meeting coming up, 27th, 28th, <clears throat> and the follow-up on the 4th if, there, if we had any weather problems. Um, this is all on the RASC Ottawa website, um, and I believe my email has been sent out in the, in the uh, Astro Notes as well. Other than that, 
Any questions? Oh, That's it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Thank you so much for uh, taking on that role. Uh, star parties, public star parties are always a big part of the center and our outreach mandate. All right, so some of you will have seen uh, this email that went out. Uh, I'm just going to uh, just uh, do, mention it quickly. Uh, there's the uh, Lennox, Lennox and Eddington, uh, Addington, sorry. Uh, there's going to be a uh, so the spring, uh, spring sky, so there's going to be a dark sky viewing uh, event, again, weather permitting, obviously. Uh, and it's going to be located, it's going to occur at uh, 7, 7980 County Road 41, Erinsville. I'm not sure where that is, although I'm sure you can plug that into Google Maps and it'll tell you. Yes? It's about 11 kilometers south on, from Highway 7, when you hit Caligar, turn <coughs> You hit Caligar, turn, Caligar, turn, turn right? Left, turn, turn left, down towards yeah. 401. Okay, so we hit Caligar. Right. Okay, we hit Caligar, turn left. And it'll be uh, the weekend of May 7th to May 10th from 9 to 10 30 p.m. So uh, if you're going to be in that area, uh, make, make note of that. That's tomorrow. It's this weekend. Yeah. That's this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> That's this weekend, yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the late notes, but that's me. Uh, International Astronomy Day. Uh, it's going to be the Saturday, May 14th, and it's going to be here uh, at the museum. Uh, as you can see, we'll have, there'll be daytime activities, uh, including uh, t telescope clinic and indoor exhibits. And then from 8:30 p.m. to 11 p.m., there'll be a uh, free public star party. If you're interested in volunteering, uh, get in touch with uh, our wonderful tech master, Chris, at this email address. And uh, hopefully it'll be a fun time. Uh, oh, and these are just uh, images from past uh, international astronomy days. So we have to join in the like, white. No idea why that's suddenly happening. Uh, so look, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun time. It'll be a fun time. Right? No question. All right. Uh, oh, Rob, do you want to do you want to mention something quickly here? This is your little. I don't know if there's any if there's any more information than other than this on here, but uh, you you you're better able to tell it. All the information is on the slide, but I'm here to promote it. <laughs> um, twice a year, I invite people up in my observatory. It's got a 24-inch um, Tony and Cassidy and in a building observatory, 28 acres, sorry, 38 acres of open field where you can set up telescopes and so on. It's kind of in the uh, located Carlton Place. Here's Perth, here's Smith Falls, and it's right down here. If we actually uh, it's uh, to drive down, usually it's Highway 416, go through, North, turn off at North Gore, then follow the highway down to Smith Falls, south of Smith Falls, to there. I think and it's an open house, so you can come on the Friday night, I'll be there if it's cloudy, show up on Saturday. If you plan on coming on Saturday, it's bound to be cloudy on Saturday, but it'll be clear on Friday. <laughs> and usually on the Saturday night, we go into Perth for dinner, I don't pay for that, you do. Uh, so, but I'll set the reservation. So please contact me during the week before if you want to go down, so I'll uh, go to the dinner so I can make sure there's a reservation. And depending upon your constitution, you can go swimming in the lake. I won't fall. <laughs> Some people, however, if you, if you decide to drive, and as you get older and older, you don't like to drive back at 1, 2, 3, 4 in the morning, you can always camp in the field. Again, there's plenty of room there. There's no more cattle in the field, and uh, so you don't have to worry about that. The next slide shows a bit more of a uh, blow up of it. Here's Perth, Smith Falls, and you drive down, perhaps down to Lombardy, then you drive along the Rideau Ferry Road, and just by the bridge, you go south, southwest. If you want to get a map, email me, and I will email it out to you. And uh, I don't publish it too much, simply because I don't want uh, 
ne'er-do-wells finding it too much. But it'll be interesting because Mars is going to be large, and with the 24-inch uh, Cassegrain, it's neat to see Mars at 1,000 power. Weather uh, scene permitting, of course. I don't think I've used it up at 1,000 power for a few years, but when it is good, it is astounding. So again, it's um, the last weekend of the month, May 26th on Friday, after 8 p.m., make sure I get up there. And then on Saturday, the next night, after 5 p.m., you should go to dinner around 5 p.m. to dine, back about 8 p.m. to observe. Uh, I advise you not to come out at midnight because it's dark and, you'll have, and there, won't, there aren't any lights there. So, <clears throat> you, and you'll not be appreciated if you drive in with your yeah, eye beams on. So please give us a call if you're interested and I'll fill you into more detail. And uh, we'll also test out amber light here. Mm -hmm. Okay, see you then. Okay, this is uh, something that we found on the internet. Uh, we won't, uh, we won't play the video. Um, it's really just a car commercial. But the interesting part is down here. Now, you can't really see it, but this says, uh, proud supporter of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. So Subaru has apparently uh, given uh, money to the National Center and they're supporting us. And this what this is the plane, Yes, well, that's the... Um, yeah, that's the logo for the uh, vehicle. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Subaru is the Japanese name for the Planet's Cluster. Uh, and on this website, uh, there's links to uh, Dark Sky uh, and kind of constellations getting started uh, and a few other things. Um, yeah, so if you want to check it out, look up Subaru Dark Sky and it will bring you to this website. All right, so Snell's Pick of the Month is uh, stargazing with binoculars, something that uh, a lot of a lot of you do, I know, and uh, it's a good way to get started. And now, as is somewhat traditional, we have space weird but true, but not by me today. Janet, take it away. Hello, everybody. Um, First, I'd like to thank uh, Roadside America for uh, bringing this story to my attention. Um, the following uh, comments that I'm going to be making were uh, put together but with their report and with information and pictures gleaned from Wikipedia and Pinterest. So in other words, the only thing that's original about my comments is my editorial slant. So the first slide here, we see, uh, the, and the reason I'm doing this is because the anniversary of their um, launch is coming up at the end of May. So uh, what we see here is Miss Baker, her name, see her lovely beads around her neck. Uh, she was a squirrel monkey, um, seen posing here with a uh, model Jupiter uh, AM-18 rocket. Um, she had a companion monkey whose name was Miss Abel. Uh, we'll see her in a minute. Uh, she was a rhesus monkey. Um, and uh, on May 28, 1959, uh, the two of them were propelled 580 kilometers into space from Cape Canaveral. So almost 57 years ago today. Uh, the pair made history by being the first two animals to survive a 16 minute space flight, which included nine minutes of weightlessness during their 2,400 kilometer trip. Upon Miss Baker's return from space, she was compensated with a banana <laughs> and a cracker, uh, and then immediately rolled over and went to sleep. Uh, next slide. So uh, you see her companion, uh, Miss Abel, there on the left. I love these names, Miss Abel and Miss Baker. Uh, unlike her companion, who died four days later from cardiac arrest, Miss Baker went on to live a long and coddled life. From her pre-flight pre days in a Miami pet shop, uh, where she just hung around, she soared to popularity after the flight, appearing on the cover of Life magazine, 
with Miss Abel and flying first class with her own personal physician when making television appearances. After the heyday of post-flight stardom, Miss Baker settled down with her husband, Big George, um, and that was in 1962. Uh, and they lived together at the Naval Aerospace Medical Center in Pensacola, Florida, uh, until Big George took the bucket. <laughs> and then when Big George passed on uh, January 8, 1979, Miss Baker remarried. Uh, she remarried a primate named Norman. And the ceremony, I kid you not, was presided over by Alabama District Court Judge Dan McCord. It was reported that Miss Baker refused to wear her white wedding veil for the big day, tearing it off after only a few seconds. Next slide, please. Today, <laughs> today, <laughs> I didn't know if I could get through this with a straight face. <laughs> Today, her monkey knot space capsule can be seen by visitors in the U.S. Space and Rocket Center Museum in Huntsville, uh, Alabama, where her granite tombstone, which we see here, stands outside the main entrance. The inscription on the pillar reads, first U.S. animal to fly in space and return alive. Miss Baker is interred, uh, interred along with her two husbands, Big George and Norman. According to the museum website, there is no admission to visit her grave, and children who visit the museum frequently place a banana on her monument in her memory. Next slide, please. So, Miss Baker, on the upcoming 57th anniversary of your space flight, we salute you and all animals who gave their lives in the pursuit of the advancement of space exploration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. It's a lovely story. Um, well, certainly, I think it's one of the uh, uns certainly animals are are among the un unsung heroes of the uh, space program. You know, just something interesting I noticed about that. I'm just going to go back a few slides. Uh, to the cover of Life magazine. Interesting, 1959, big riddle for the U.S. family. Where does the money go? Uh, yeah. It doesn't seem to change, does it? Yeah. Same thing, but, uh, well, Miss Baker, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, your contribution to, uh, to science. All right, so thank you very much. That concludes the, uh, the formal part of the meeting. Uh, Memberships, again, as always, we uh, post this uh, information if you're interested in joining. 70, oops, sorry. 75. Uh, 75 dollars for a regular membership. Uh, family membership is 70 dollars, and youth membership is 45 dollars. Uh, membership benefits include being able to take out a scope uh, from the uh, library. Uh, you can access the site of the Fred Lassing Observatory, but not the actual building itself. That requires a separate fee. And you can also take books out from the standalone library. <clears throat> you also get these publications uh, electronically or physically, except for uh, except for the Observer's Handbook, which is now uh, only only electronic. To numbers. These are the uh, contact information for uh, the various members uh, of the uh, of the club. And again, uh, Ron St. Martin, he's got the keys to the FLO uh, for those who pay for them. Uh, meetings are, are webcast at, uh, through this uh, URL. This is our uh, website of past meetings. Tonight's audience was 153. Thank you to all, uh, all the speakers. Thank you to all those who uh, tuned in uh, on the uh, on the web, and uh, and if you downloaded this later and watched it, thank you very much uh, for doing that as well. Um, so I think uh, with that, oh, and obviously, one second, uh, we've got um, drink, uh, snacks available from our Nan Fraser uh, out the front uh, after the meeting. And as usual, the after meeting meeting is at uh, Grace O'Malley's or Gracie's, as it's called. 
Our next meeting will be uh, at 7.30 p.m. Friday, June 3rd. First meeting, uh, sorry, first Friday of June. I think we're gonna need a new picture. I think we've got a new, <laughs> a new, a new chair. Is it, actually, that's a good question. Is that a swap table night? I know traditionally it is, but. June and December, it's every six months. June and December, so, uh, so swap table uh, will ostensibly be happening. Um, again, it'll just be a, a chance for you to come in and uh, maybe get a good deal and trade. Uh, begins at seven, though. Okay. Be begins at seven, that's right. So, I mean, it's a swap table. The name's explanatory in the title, so, yeah. Just that, again, come in and swap and swap stories or stuff. Swap the equipment, I guess. All right, and so thank you very much. We can close, we can close out the, uh, the live streaming. Thank you very much to everyone for joining, whether here in the, in, in the studio or, uh, or on the web. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you all again next month. Thanks, everyone.